when you moved from um were you in Dublin? Where Dublin, were, yeah, in Dublin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, in Dublin, was it? And you're you had just you had just started and sold a small company with your co-founders then, who are now your co-founders again, mm-hmm. and you came to the Bay Area to raise money and like go do the damn thing, like go, literally go live the American dream in some sure. respect. Sure. Um, what was what was that feeling like? Trying to fit into the scene that you so badly wanted to be in. Especially like you have an accent, you're an outsider, nobody knows you, you know? Like it was interesting. When I first came here, 2011, the popular kids that everyone wanted to be friends with were extremely confident. Um and they were all crushing it, all of them, exclusively, all the time. Mm-hmm. And I felt vastly inferior to them. I didn't have their confidence. Um, my company was just getting started, and I felt very lost. And um, I definitely didn't feel like I fit in. Um, that was that led to one of the biggest lessons, and most important parts of my journey, which was to see that greatness was a bit more of a quiet and a lonelier journey, that it didn't look like going to the parties and obviously crushing it all the time. Unfortunately, all those people who were quote unquote crushing it didn't go on to create big companies that all the companies they were working with didn't work out, unfortunately. Um, and so, yeah, I learned that, um, there is a narrative, and I try and teach this to young founders now. There's a narrative and a thing that gets promoted and projected about success and confidence in people's public lives. And then there's the quiet inside private story, which is everyone's finding it really damn hard. Yeah. Everyone's struggling. Everyone's doing something really dumb at the moment. Everyone's some version of lost even the big guys, even the people I look up to, and we all looked up to, the biggest names, the m- most epic names, some of the really accomplished CEOs that you've interviewed, I guarantee on the very same day you spoke to them, were suffering some serious problem. I- I'll tell you, I think um, those are some of the most insecure people that I've ever met. And, um, and you know, insecure, uncertain just yeah. finding their way through uh, the dark. All, all, all of us. Think of... Those are the people that... Those are the people, the, the names, the big, big, big names, are always the ones that follow up. How did I do? What was the... That's okay. I mean, look... What was the reception? That's you know, the, like... The, yeah, like that, but but that, you would think that, that... You would think that it would be the inverse. You would think that once maybe. you've gotten to a certain point, those voices maybe. in your head, quiet. But I found it's almost the opposite in some respects. Well... The first question is, which came first, the insecurity or the success? And often the insecurity drives us to do the crazy things we spoke about earlier, make all those trade-offs. The other part is that um, regardless of how much work you do in yourself and the personal and spiritual journey you take, your bullshit never really goes away. Your, 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 Your psychology remains intact, even if the rough edges get smoothed away. Third thing is, however... A lot of these leaders and founders are not working on themselves and their makeup and their maladaptive psychology actually is simultaneously a recipe for unhappiness and success. Mm -hmm. And through the mix of their obsession with being successful to try and be happy, they actually never make time to work on themselves and they never actually get get to know themselves and they never heal and cure from some of these things that make them so insecure. So it's a big tight knot, this situation. But uh, I think all the people, whether they're the big names or the little names, uh, deserve um, praise and appreciation for the cool things that they're doing and including for their insecurity. And they deserve to be recognized as humans that are struggling like the rest of us. And I think if we did that, we would make entrepreneurship and building just a whole lot easier. 
do you think that's why the job is so lonely now? Because, because the CEO feels the same feeling that everybody else does around not knowing what's the future going to hold. Are we going to get this key employee? Are we going to hit the quarter? Are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? But also, they don't have the luxury of not putting on a brave face for everybody else. Do you think that space between those two things is the is the loneliness? I think that's a. I think that's a good hypothesis that explains a little bit of it. You know, to connect, we need to be vulnerable and open so that people can see the real us. Hmm. Um, to get help, we all need help. We need to be vulnerable and open so that people can see how to help us. And for most leaders, their MO is to be the opposite of these things, is to be closed off and not admit and certainly not project their flaws uh, and so that's going to prevent them from getting connection and help and yeah that will produce a degree of loneliness so i like that hypothesis i think that makes a lot of sense what is um before we get too far what does intercom do for those that haven't heard we're a customer service platform so for any digital businesses business that wants to do customer service we work for them what makes us different is that we're ai first we can see the ways in which ai is going to change Absolutely everything. And so to put it in a very blunt way, we want to be the next Zendesk. Zendesk did an outstanding job in the previous generation of serving the masses of digital businesses and helping them answer their customers at scale. Now they're a little old school, disconnected. Private equity owned. Private equity, kind of a Frankenstein product. Amazing, amazing success. Big, big fans of their founders and everything they've achieved. If we achieved half of what they achieved, we'd be delighted. But there's now an opening and we can see that AI is just going to com- completely change everything. It's going to dramatically change response times, customer satisfaction. The majority of all customer service is going to be done by AI incredibly soon. And our product already shows that. That little logo on the bottom right that everybody sees on any company website, maybe it's Intercom, but maybe it's five other companies. Right. right? It was started by That's right. you and your team. That's right. Um, you hired one of my favorite executives in the valley and i say mine like it's like my kept secret that nobody uh-huh. knew about she's a badass archana Ar- is Archana's amazing amazing yeah, she's amazing yeah incredibly intense hard on herself incredibly ambitious works so hard that's one of the greatest lessons there's many different types of executives out there and when we founders go to hire the senior polished executive the one that looks calm and collected who apparently doesn't have to work that hard appears to us to be the type of individual that we want to be actually the best executives the most experienced the most brilliant executives in all of the companies they work their ass off they work super long hours um they're in the weeds um and archon is one of those my hypothesis is that this company is well over a hundred million in revenue, has well over a billion dollar valuation, bunch of money in the bank. You returned as the founder of the company. Hundreds, ten, hundreds of millions in revenue. Hundreds, of, hundreds of millions. Please, yeah, please. hundreds. What is there a number that's out? Uh, there's no. Let's go there's hundreds. No, yeah, hun- multiple hundreds. Yeah. And you return. You return as the founder, which right. I want to talk about. Right. It, it, it's rare to see a company do this. Do you know what I mean? Like it's rare to see a company at hundreds of millions of revenue reinvigorate Mm -hmm. kind of along this whole thread. What a cool history you have with Kleiner Perkins in so many ways. I didn't even really put all these things together. Well, Kleiner Perkins has been like a work in progress for the last 10 years, right? Yeah. So like yeah. the moon came over, then Ilya came over. Yeah. And, and so, you worked with them individually at their totally, previous firms. Totally. Now they're here. Totally. I was the collateral damage of the production of the new <laughs> KP, right? Because my moon was on my board and he left. I was like, well, see ya. And then Ilya was on my board and then he left. And I was like, well, see ya. You mean when they joined KP? When they joined KP. <laughs> so yeah, I was certainly the collateral damage, but thankfully got to maintain our relationships and, um, and KP yeah. did all the better for it. It's yeah. been amazing the last the last seven years with those guys on board. It's been amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's been, um, yeah, it's been five years for me. It's um, really, it's impressive. Yeah. It's, uh, it was not obvious then. Yeah. I'll say that. Yep. 
And I think it's just going to start it also. Wait, wait, wait another five, 10 years. I think some of the deals that are getting done right now, I bet are going to be pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing that I wanted to explore with you was this, this thing of like, I hiring an, an Archana at this time of the company requires a, like, she's going to have a, like, she needs to have a big job. Sure. You know, like, sure. like you need to give her enough clay of course to put a fingerprint of course on the company but 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 a company of the maturation of intercom rarely is willing to give enough of the legos you know yeah i think great companies reinvent themselves all the time they constantly operate with a small company mindset one of the main things I said when I came back is, even though we're a th- we were a thousand plus employees, I said, we're not a big company. I refuse for us to be a big company. We're not doing any big company things. How do you put that into play? Um, I let some big company executives leave. Mm. I ripped up the big company values. I asked the company, I surveyed the company, what are all the ways in which we're big and slow and shitty? And I changed a lot of processes. I started to operate with a great deal of intensity. Um, after I joined, the 12 months after I joined, the rate at which we shipped software increased by 41% over the previous 12 months. Um, I held a weekly all hands. So I would get up every single week in, full, in front of the entire company. I started a new program called P52, Project 52, to reinvent the company in 52 weeks. And we counted down. Counted down and through the entire year, um, we um, just worked in new and scrappy ways. We shipped things that were imperfect. We didn't create a bunch of perfect decks. I made every single all hands deck. Um, I let go of all the internal comms people and all the stuff that made us polished, and we got back to just being very scrappy and unpolished. We reset our ambitions. Um, we said, hey, we did a good job when it's a million, that's fantastic, but we're a drop in the ocean. The TAM of the market we're selling to is a $35 billion TAM. We've got less than 1% of that uh, to answer your question about our revenue. Um, like, we're tiny. We're just getting started. Uh, all of those ideas, um, and including just the way you show up, I started to answer um, customers on Twitter. I started to apologize for customer, to customers on Twitter. I was very open and raw and authentic. There were many F-bombs and other bombs in my tweets as I told people they were absolutely right with their criticism. And I just did all the things that early st- stage founders and companies do. And um, that's available to anyone at all stages. And you'll see all of the truly brilliant companies and founders do that. They never get comfortable and they never allow for stability they invite a little bit of chaos and they um, refuse to crystallize and get comfortable and that's the kind of energy that allows you to make big swings and bring in an arch and give her a bunch of equity make her president of the company and say hey we're just getting started we need a new founding moment and we need a new member of the founding team I mean, I told her, I want, I want to build a new founding team. I tell all of the leaders at Intercom that they're founders. They're and you put your money where me. your mouth is. Of course. Very much so. Yeah, you just have to keep doubling down, keep going. And all of the best people love that. Brilliant people love that energy. Technology companies, the best technology companies at their core are just builder companies, building companies, building energy. And... Um, builders love that mindset they don't want to be comfortable in a big organization with boring processes they want to move fast they want to take risks they want to get crazy they want personal connection with the ceo and the founding team they want recognition for the work that they're doing they want to take risks and so this energy far from uh, turning great people away it attracts great people and then it repels the people who want a comfortable environment. And that's totally fine. There's a lot of people who want stability in their work environment, which I totally respect. And there's a lot of brilliant companies out there that they can get it. 
um, but the best builders, the tr the X Factor people with incredible talents, they want to be part of this madness. What what has when you um, what has surprised you that was the hardest to like re refounding the company is just a <clears throat> like there's a lot of things that you can do which you just described, but there's still structural challenges, right? You tell like, me. Like what? Um, well, I think you still have to, in some ways, protect the hundreds of millions in revenue, no? Sure. But you have to be willing to risk it also. I mean, all of the worst decisions by professional CEOs and late-stage CEOs are based on fear. Mm -hmm. They're based on fear. And it's really, really hard when you're a hired CEO because your job is to not F it up. Mm -hmm. When you're a founder, you have the moral right and ability and standing to F it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, your kind of, your remit is to uh, bring that X factor. So you must be willing to take those risks. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I and my co-founders and, and, and the founding team and the people around me, we've had our success. We've made a bunch of money. Um, we've s found recognition for our hard work. And it gives us the freedom to play for something bigger. No one, none of those people are satisfied with a, let's take the money off the table and walk. We could sell the company today, no problem. We get inbound all the time from strategics, private equity. Um, everyone is in it to get crazy and have fun and make the most of their short lives and short careers and be proud of this thing we built. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, when you bring in someone like Archana, you rewrite all these things that are that were pre-existing in the company um you redid the website you redid it bunch. you relaunched it. you literally relaunched the company all the stuff new values like new is strategy, there any new precedent brand. for that i'm sure i'm sure there certainly is but we changed all the things yeah <laughs> like it's yeah, pretty yeah. incredible yeah. do you um one of the things that i thought about before this conversation was do you have to re-architect your entire platform no um, no. And, and the reason I ask is obviously with all the AI and LLMs that are coming about, like, does that just upend the it, existing infrastructure? I mean, it entirely does. Every single seats company, every single software company that sells seats for people to do work is now about to be disrupted by AI because AI is going to do the work that these people used to do and the AI doesn't need the seats. So every company, us, Salesforce, ServiceNow, need to become AI companies. Um, we need to make the majority and then all in the next few years of our revenue from AI and not, and not workflow products. Um, that by necessity does upend all the things, but I see it as an opportunity for the people who are willing to be crazy and rip things up and move fast and damage the revenue and break the rules and take a long-term approach because the bigger companies are scared to do all the above. Yeah. Do you, um, you're, um, you're kind of a, I say kind of, you are an absolute OG in the SaaS space. Mm. There's like, a bunch of OGs of my, there are, uh, by the way, Mamoon and Ilya have been around That's many right. of them. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I'd put Aaron Levy squarely in that uh, category with you. Yeah. Parker Conrad. Parker. Yeah. Parker's kind of in. New, yeah. Newer in some ways, but you know, Parker's been in the business as long as I have. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. There is a bunch of you. Um, not many, but there's a bunch. Uh, does, and when you came to the States in 2011, it was like, it was, I mean, just coming out of the financial crisis, like it was big, really important web 2.0, whatever that means, companies were being built at the application mm -hmm. layer. Mm-hmm. All of these big ones that you know today, the Ubers, mm -hmm. the Airbnbs, et cetera. Yeah. Um, that moment, sorry, were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to say, yes, you're right. There yeah. was a, a, a certain genre of company was being built, then a certain category. It was cloud and all of the previous on-prem software was now moving to the cloud. Yep. And mobile, kind of hitting it at the same mobile time. Mobile came pretty soon after that. You're yep. right. It was also a time just for Silicon Valley and technology. There was a lot of exuberism. When I came here in 2011, there was 
so many meetups, a lot of kids, hackers, dreamers, creators, nerds, a lot of innocent energy, but people were excited to build SaaS software, workflow software. And the story of SaaS went the way of Silicon Valley in San Francisco in that it matured. We hit peak SaaS some years ago. We hit peak SF in Silicon Valley some years ago. And uh, there was kind of a lack of energy, high degree of jadedness, a lot of sameness, a uh, lack of growth, um, both SaaS and San Francisco, I'm drawing the parallel too closely now, uh, came to the end of their um, uh, inspiration. And I say all of that because um, I see the same energy again right now. I see Silicon Valley and tech and San Francisco come back new growth, new energy, new early stage startups, and now a new gen genre of technology company. SaaS is kind of done. They'll be like, obviously, software subscription models, but people are just building so much more interesting things. Um, so many AI companies, hardware companies, defense tech, health tech, so much stuff now that uh, we didn't see in 2011. And so, yeah, that's just something that is just, top of mind, front and center for me, as I compare my journey and I compare the energy I saw in 2011 that just faded out in tech, it's back. As of six months ago, it's fully back. And uh, this is about to be a golden age for technology and for kind of the Bay Area and Silicon Valley and technology. San Francisco. I hope so. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we think that this is um, about to be bigger than Internet, cloud, mobile combined. I I think so. Um, this the scale of early stage. I think it's bigger than ever before. When I started Intercom, my co-founders, twenty eleven, there was very few seed funds. Now there's so many seed funds, so many startups raising at that stage. So many accelerators. The people in those accelerators, whether it's Y Combinator or HF Zero, are remarkably high quality companies. The things they're building are cool and sexy. There's some cool, there's some uncool and unsexy things too. That's okay. That's okay. We need that technology also. But there's just bright, brilliant new things. Oh my God. I've started to invest deliberately now over the last few months. Got carried away and I've invested in well over a dozen in the last you know month even. And I decided I'm only going to invest in things that just are cool. Not things I think could make money. Not things that I could relate to, not things that obviously I could help with because I built a big SaaS company, but things I thought that were cool. And there's just so many. I can't invest in all of them. So something is happening right now. People don't realize it. And I don't mean for this to be demotivating for people around the world. Tech is now far more global than it ever was. And I have many negative things to say about San Francisco, but it's just impossible to deny that this is the epicenter of that again. Um, it's just shocking and incredible. It's, um, it's a, uh, yeah, I think like, uh, whatever the quote is of overestimating what we can do in a year, underestimating what we can do in 10 yeah. feels about how I feel mm. right now, you know? Um, but then, you look at like even three months ago, the state of the world. Sure. And you're like, holy shit, kind of a lot's changed. It, it's going to continue <laughs> to change. Know? It's going to continue to change remarkably, <laughs> remarkably. Going to continue to change. On the technology side, we definitely do not know or realize or can yet fully imagine the degree to which AI is going to disrupt everything, everything. This is way bigger than cloud or mobile and maybe bigger than the internet. It's giant and we can't fathom it. Um, we can't fathom it. What's, where does that confidence come from for you? When, when uh, ChatGPT came out, I actually wasn't as excited as everyone else. thought it was kind of cool, but for whatever reason, didn't like really get me going from a nerdy point of view. And so I actually came into it a little bit, if not cynical, but at the very least, clear-minded. I wasn't drunk on the hype. And that had me try and disprove the, the 
positivity I would see externally and internally inside Intercom. I've been through a number of hype cycles, as have we all. Um, and I now I try to be very diligent about not getting caught up in such hype. And I couldn't talk myself out of the idea that AI is just going to do all the things. It's going to do all knowledge work. Why? It's These LLMs are just remarkably good at doing knowledge work type work conversing, processing information, consolidating. And when you add simple functionality to it, like we have at Intercom, where it now answers customer questions, it now on average just about 45% of all inbound tickets for people use FIN. Um, its power just is magnified either for, even further. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. 45% of all sure. tickets Insane. are answered automatically. That's, average so we have customers what was the average a quarter ago when we started less than a year ago it was 26 percent. so we've added an extra 20 percent points in just one year where do you think it'll be in a year two years uh, two years close to 70 percent 70 70 percent without a shadow of a doubt we already have customers that are doing 70 80 90 percent of all their support volume through our ai and it's not deflection the customers it's really, resolution it's real resolution instant resolution rather than the customers waiting days they get a response straight away and csat is stable the customers love it so the agents no longer have to do the repetitive painful boring work answering the same questions all the time and they can focus on the more human creative interesting work that requires their empathy and creativity the customer gets instant answers instant epic answers and the business doesn't actually have to pay for that repetitive human work. It can actually have technology do it instead, and it has customers far happier getting back to doing the things that the cost that the company wants them to do. I mean, this is just customer service alone. Every single category, every single type of knowledge work is going to get done by AI, and all blue collar work also. I keep bringing up the story of this toilet cleaning bot. Don't know if you've seen this. No, it's remarkable. It's a bot. Pretty big robot on wheels. It can, can traverse a building in an elevator. So it goes floor by floor. Okay, floor by floor. It goes to the restroom, opens the handle, goes in the door, locks it, cleans the entire restroom, leaves, and on to the next. So it can clean all the restrooms in a building all on its own. So we thought originally that AI was coming after knowledge work and blue collar work was safe. No, there's going to be AI-driven robots doing all of that work soon and really soon really really soon in the next number of years we are not ready for the degree to which our world is going to change in insane and incredible ways and when you were coming back to the business what year when was that it was 18 months ago 18 months ago and it was i guess kind of coinciding with some of the stuff that was happening on the i came AI back front. a month before chat gpt you did came out and were those things independent? Uh, I guess it must have been. Like, maybe you saw some of this. They must have been. Maybe there's cosmic uh, things at play and it was meant to be. And this is a gift from the universe to make my job spicier and also easier. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, they were completely independent. When I came back, I didn't imagine that AI was going to have to change everything. We had been working with machine learning for many years, five years before that. We had an AI product, but it wasn't nothing compared to what we can build today so this was a moment where we had to just rip up everything and start again yeah why'd you leave i was sick chiefly sick that's a whole other podcast uh i was sick i was beat up in the press i was burned out some hard years of bad revenue growth but primarily i got was exposed to mold um and it's a whole boring painful story can i um i read every single article before this, I read everything. And first of all, I'll tell you, I, I, um, you have a Parker esque mm. resilience it's about great, you. It's a compliment, indeed. It's a, like uh, it. amazing it, man. Yeah, watching you, seeing your name dragged through the mud like mm. that, it made me sick to my stomach. Mm. Thank you. Um, and um, I hope 
that tearing people down who are ambitious for the sake of their ambition is a relic of the past. Yeah. Because I think those, I think the problem with when that happens to people like you or Parker is that it stifles people's ambition because I think people will internalize that there's a cost of succeeding. There there is a great cost. Um, No one imagines their story is going to go the way that Parker's did, mine, or some other people. Uh, Us founders are kind of just uh, permanently hopeful. So I don't know if it discourages people, um, but certainly the people who are building this world, trying to build a better future, trying to contribute to the economy, um, uh, America, solve the problems of humanity, whether they do so in an abstract way or a direct way, I think they deserve to be protected and celebrated. Um, and so, you know, that's certainly my, my outlook. Do I will say, that way? Go ahead, sorry. I will say that, you know, there's a certain gift. It's a very painful gift. It's the worst gift I've ever received. I'm not really a gift guy, but this one sucked. But it was a gift. There's a certain gift you get from being criticized and uh, embarrassed. And that it's that it trashes your ego. That's where the pain comes from. All your ideas about yourself, the concept you had about your perfection, it just eviscerates that. But once eviscerated, you're now free from the insecurities about your imperfection and you're free from the worry of people finding out about your imperfection and when you're free of that you can do things like go back to the company you started rip up all the rules have people upset with you my glass door rating was 37 percent after i came back come on yeah i'd have never heard of a glass door rating that low um i'm sure someone beat that record but you don't care because you know who you are you know what you stand for you know that what you're doing is pure and good um, you know your flaws too and the mistakes you've made um, but you're just not scared about um, being attacked for being imperfect because you know that that's who you are and it's fine when someone says something to you that you know is true when you fundamentally know it's true like hey you've got two arms you're like mm. but if you have something that you're kind of a little scared of uh, that you don't want others to know that's the thing that really really hurts and I see so many founders myself previously included to try and create this very perfect image for themselves and it holds them back um it's remarkable i invest in a lot of companies i meet a lot of founders and i have many peers many friends i've been lucky to be the friends of all of my contemporaries all the great names um at least of, at my stage all of them like 100 percent of them all disagree with the notion that they should have to engage with political and social issues in the workplace and basically 99.9 percent of them are afraid to push back on that because they're so afraid about their image and so that's the gift that's the really shitty gift that being attacked brings it burns your ego identity and allows you to be you and that's just something I've been discovering over the last 18 months. Like, oh my God, I'm free. Yeah, you shaved your head. Well, that happened before then. Yeah, but it's the same feeling, isn't it? Yeah, you're free. Like, the, stop, that stop lying. Is gone. Stop lying to yourself. Yeah. Be you. It's amazing. When, um, when you were gone, um, so you did whatever, 12 years, 11 years. Uh, 11 years founder CEO? I did like I was 10 years gone okay. for two years yeah. and did you go back to Ireland I went to Ireland for a couple months what were you doing what were you thinking about <sighs> I when okay so I started Intercom when I was 26 and I was working for myself before then never had a real job always obsessed with success never really took time off when I was working and dreaming of time off 
of quitting. I like would joke with my friends that I retired. It was like a known joke, but it was like a fun joke. I dreamed I would wake with the rising of the sun. Step out of bed, maybe I'd stretch for an hour, meditate. Then I'd go my, myself a delicious meal, maybe a juice. Maybe I'd walk in the park, <laughs> smile at the birds, and, you know, pick a little flower, and then maybe retire to my office and do some deep thinking. I might read a highbrow book that all those other smart guys are reading, and then do some writing, and... uh probably in some important writing and it felt very flowing and monastic. I'm like, Oh my God, the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Well, actually what happened was I'd wake up. I'd be like, Oh my God, it's bright outside. What time is it? Look at my phone. It's like 10, 10 AM. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well I guess I'd be, I'd then get on my phone for like 50 minutes I'm like, okay, fuck. I need Aimlessly to get, scrolling. Yeah, I need to get doing up. Doing what you hate to do. I need to get up. Yeah, so I get up, have some shit breakfast. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I have a meeting in five minutes. Because I still had some meetings. I was chairman of the board and I was doing other things. Take my meeting. And then I'd like have lunch late, whatever. It's like 3.30 p.m. I'm like, oh, I should step outside. But then I have another meeting. And then that was the day. That was the day gone. And I learned actually that there's not that much time. We don't have this much, that much time on this earth. The days go by so quick, even if you're not doing things. And um, so it was nice to have that freedom and flexibility and flowing opportunity to have a shitty unproductive day. But for a person that thrives on productivity and purpose and meaning, I decided that I was willing to trade my freedom and flowing flexibility for intense dedication to achievement and building. And so I'm glad of the time off. I'm already dreaming of it again. Are you? Yeah. You always want the and thing you, you can And you were taking care of your health and stuff. I was trying to get better. Yeah. I got super sick and I was like sick through that time, which is unfortunate. But um, yeah, you always want you. You're want dreaming you about that have. now? Of course. Do you still dream of success? Of course. Do you think you're successful? I am and I want more. You do? Yes. And are they the, 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 what, what's on the scoreboard of success in your mind? Like the honest answer. I know it's I'm like. I'm going to give you the honest answer. Yeah. 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 Not like the. You've, only been, want, you've, you've been getting all the, the honest big, answers. The big company. From me. No, no, no. Make no. people's careers. You were never going to get that answer. <laughs> um, okay. Intercom is a brilliant company with brilliant people in a very, very unique culture. We're innovation forward. We build before everyone else. People copy us. But we've not been a great go-to-market organization. We've not brought it to market at scale. That's why I hired Arjuna. We're not worth the tens or hundreds of billions of dollars that if we were as pivotal and as, and as important as we think we are, we should be. And so with Intercom, I want to see, can we get closer to there? I also want to contribute meaningfully to this time of technology. Everything's changing. AI is of so fundamental and an important purpose and importance. I want to be a big part of that. I want to help tell that story. I want to do it in a great way. I think it's important to build right now. It's a political statement. America needs it. The world needs it. Uh, it's important to fight back from the socialist pressures, pressures that hate capitalism and people who start things. I want to contribute to that with Intercom. So that's the first piece. There's a lot of spiritual, personal measures of achievement that I have for Intercom. That's the first piece. Secondarily, I have my personal goals. And I've both checked boxes I had in the past, whether it was money or recognition, building a certain scale of company, contributing to technology. But I've also got closer to understanding what gives me purpose. They include things like enabling other builders and celebrating builders. This new generation here in San Francisco and around the world, I've learned the hard way, the do's and the don'ts of this game. I want to help them. 
I want to help them be more successful than I was. I want to help them have more fun than I had. I want to be part of their story. So I'm investing as much as I can. And I'm giving them the raw, real input and guidance they won't get from anyone else. Um, I want to, in other ways, celebrate and promote that builder, that creator energy. And I have another project that I'm in the very early stages working on right now that will celebrate these builders, celebrate innovation and risk taking. So the answer is there's new levels of achievement for Intercom and then there's new personal levels. And I haven't even spoken about my health and my spiritual growth and my own wellness and happiness, which is important to me too. When you, um, when you came, when you, how long until the feeling started to settle in of, oh my God, what am I doing? Like, I need to get back. Or what am I doing with time, to time off? Yeah, like, I need to get back to this company. Like, how long before the veneer of the story in your mind began to dissipate? The story was never... It had no polish on it. You know, I ran away from the company I started. No one wants to do that. I was so sick I couldn't see some days. So I literally had no choice. I was like deeply demotivated from getting beat up in the press and our revenue trajectory was not awesome. So that was that was not fun. Did you you feel like you ran? I had to. I mean, I literally could not see some day. I was like on calls and my eyes were open and I saw a blur. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm dying. Um, so fuck SaaS companies right now. Yeah. And yeah, I totally ran from it. I'm like, this is not the most important thing in my life. And um, yeah, of course I ran. Um, but that didn't didn't feel good. To, to, to a builder and a person whose purpose is so intimately tied to a project like Intercom, leaving it, especially when you're needed, feels not great. Did and, you think you were going to come back? No, that was never my plan. I thought we would sell the company. We were talking to some really big companies that were chasing us. I thought I had pulled a move of epic proportions where I stepped away and someone else would have to be the CEO post-acquisition. I was like, wow, you nailed this. Yeah. <laughs> and then that didn't happen. <laughs> Fell apart. Fell apart. And then we were supposed to go public on the 15th of June. During uh, COVID. During COVID 2022. Yeah. And then that fell apart, like a lot of IPOs. And I'm like, well, um, this isn't about to have a tidy ending. Not only do I feel shit for running away, but like the thing I have so much of my personal pride and net worth tied up into is headed in a really, really bad direction. And I had already sold equity and had money in other places and assets. And so the money thing wasn't the primary driver. But Intercom was something that I was just very personally proud of. It's a creative endeavor. It was my way, due to my insecurities, to project to the world what I'm capable of. And when it started to fail and look crappy and shitty, um, so did I. And that was my own failings. Someday, perhaps, I'll learn to be happy without the projects I care so much about being a success. But it wasn't. And so... I had to come back. Um, but I was also excited and energized about the opportunity to have purpose again and bring to bear everything I learned. You know, it's amazing that you learn a lot from building and failing and winning and failing and winning and failing. You learn a lot. But the lessons don't quite get crystallized till you step away. You have to kind of down tools for some reason. Just like you have to sleep every night to kind of lock in and synthesize memories. You need to not be at the grindstone to put together your principles. And so one of my superpowers, in fact, comes from the fact that I have got to step away where other leaders have not. And I got to look at a dis at myself from a distance and my own performance and say, and realize here's the things I believe in. And then add to that that I no longer deeply cared about my reputation, at least in the same way. That's kind of bullshit to say if I don't care about my reputation, but in the same way. I got to just apply my principles in a, in a non-tethered fashion. So it all came together in a pretty beautiful f fashion. TBD on where it all goes, but 
It what was the good. what was the wind up like to get to to get to the point where you were like, okay, like holy shit, like I just told all these people I'm out, you know, like how did you start? You unwound everything, yeah, and then you have to rebuild back up. I tried to convince myself that this is a terrible idea. I told my two younger sisters who care a lot about me, and they said, "Don't do it." Everyone who cared about me, don't do it because they could see what it does to me. Yeah. You know, because it's such an obsession, and I trade things off. It's like, don't go back, don't go back. That's stepping backwards. That's going backwards. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, you're right. And and then I found two camps of p- friends. Some that were like, don't do it, and then others that were like, fuck yeah, do it. <laughs> you know, because it's like the ultimate ego trip, going back to your company and ripping things yeah. up and like fixing it. And yeah. won't you be an incredible champion? Like such an ego trip that thing so the people who don't care about my ego and actually love me are actually like don't do it on and the people who loved my ego who want me to be the badass founder are like fuck yeah yeah and i think i integrated both of those two messages they were like they were like the angel and the devil on each of my shoulders and i think i integrated them and i decided i would try my best to engage in a way that was healthier for me, try to put down my ego a little bit and do this in a more principled, calm and quiet fashion and see if I could challenge myself to a new way of being a CEO and being a CEO of this company. And I've long believed that you can't really move on from your insecurities or heal from your trauma in a vacuum. You have to be in the arena, as it were. And so I think I knew that the the fragility and the pressures of my ego that made this work so difficult for me, I would only heal from, from doing the work itself, triggering that ego and working through that difficulty and pain. What did you, did you have to weigh trade-offs on, okay, now that I'm coming back, here's what I have to give up? Um, I did, you know, I used to want, I had, I had, I had two ambitions for my time off apart from the monastic lifestyle I just described to you. One was to be able to sleep without setting an alarm and two was to be able to have a drink uh, during the week. Cause like I would work so hard and I would love a glass of wine with a friend and I'm like, nope, I'm not gonna let myself do it cause I have to work the next day. So they were my like, two soft ambitions and the alcohol thing is just not good for anyone, whether or not you're, you're, you're working. So I kind of didn't do much of that while I was off, but I did do the sleeping thing. And I said, yeah, you're going to have to become rem- become regimented again. You're going to have to live that bullshit lifestyle where you've got eight meetings a day. It's not a hero's lifestyle. People like um, fetishize this lifestyle. They like the idea of this badass running meetings to meetings, being so busy that you don't have time for anyone else. It's bullshit. It sucks. When I was finally free, and I have a bunch of CEO friends, I got to see how shit they were as a friend. So hard to book time with them. And I would give them shit for it, and I knew that I would have to become that again. One of these busy assholes, self-important busy assholes. So they were the trade trade-offs. I would have to live a more structured, stressed, pressured life and become a less good friend to a lot of people. And uh, and look, there's just no perfect way of living. People imagine and they try to work towards, maybe some people achieve it, a harmonious, balanced life where they've got this monastic flowing energy I described earlier, but they also work and they Mm. go to their meetings and they like strive for bigger and better things and um, build visions for the future. I haven't met a single person like that, actually. Everyone is stressed out. Everyone's running around. Um, So I don't know. I don't have a perfect answer, but that's okay. When you struggle through it, life is not perfect. You know, we just do our best. It's okay. When you came... When you had space and then came back, did you, having that space, think about doing, organizing your day differently or doing things as a CEO in the day-to-day differently? 
yeah, I had, I had ideas that I would have three or four days a week of structured meetings. And uh, each day I would have certain types of meetings. So this day I would do creative meetings, or the day, days I would do finance, other things. When you're CEO of a fast moving company, especially one that's trying to work like a startup, that stuff goes out the window so <laughs> fast. Good luck to you, my friend. You know, I'm now working seven days a week, you know, eight, nine hours a day. You know, I get lots of time off and it's squishy and, you know, working maybe on my phone when I'm like commuting to meet with a friend for a drink. And please don't think I'm fetishizing this lifestyle at all. I'm not. Um, but it's, it's really hard. It's really all encompassing. That's why people just do it for a short periods of time. I will say that people who live these lives and have these struggles, they also experience some of the deepest purpose of any I know. So it's a whole big bag of things. It's an intense, stressful life with a lot of painful prioritization, but it's deep purpose and connection with brilliant people and contributing to the world and society, knowing that you're doing things important that uh, use your talents and gifts and strengths. So it's a beautiful connection, collection of all of the above. You said earlier that part of what you want to do is be in the flow with founders that are following your footsteps in many respects and helping them with the do's and don'ts. Sure. Do you believe there's do's and don'ts? Like no. uh, tactically no. speaking? No, I don't. I know you'd like to hear some. No, no, I, I actually don't either. Yeah, yeah. Truth be told, I, yeah. I don't believe. Yeah, I hate advice. In fact, the guy that yeah. came in, uh, Ilya, has a good expression, which is that the only rule in venture capital is that there's no rules. Sure. And I think company building is in very many ways the same thing. Sure. And, I the, think, and, and the best people just keep reinventing themselves and breaking rules. Parker's a great example, right? Parker is a great example. Break the rules. Break the rules. Yeah, I'll, I'll there tell, are no rules. I'll tell you what, like... Uh, when I started this job, um, you know, I was pretty young to be in a in the like operating partner role. You're, like, still, you're still pretty young. Yeah, but like usually this job is reserved for the man or woman that's riding off into the sunset of their career and drawing from the years and decades of experience. It wasn't me. Sure. And so, you know, maybe it's because of that. But what I found myself talking to with founders was very much the emotional aspect of company building exactly yeah. what we're spending yeah. this time talking about yeah i think there's do's and don'ts around emo emotions yeah and many of the do's are experiencing the emotions i agree <laughs> with you know? i agree with um, you. very rarely very rarely did i find myself wading into deep tactical things i find that so boring the tactical stuff so boring it's not hard and context dependent and super context dependent and you can read a million blog posts about it and part of it's my own, my own personality type i like the squishy creative hippie spiritual yeah je ne sais quoi aspect of yeah. life but the tactical stuff is not hard the hardest part of this is self mastery and it's applying yourself and managing yourself and learning to love and appreciate yourself and challenging yourself to deliver all these gifts you have in a way that's least painful. Um, but I find it to be a beautiful life. And I think that not only can you contribute to society and do great things, but you can just learn so much about yourself. You know, this world affords us a lot of resources. We tend to make great money. We can afford a lot of different help, whether it's great therapists or spiritual teachers. It's the most fulfilling life I can possibly imagine. Um, and so if there's a do or a don't, it's to please make time and space and take seriously that work on yourself. You know, remarkably, very few founders do that. They fear and criticize and judge therapy. And I see therapy as, as this epic secret weapon. If you know yourself and how to connect to yourself and communicate and be vulnerable and real, your ability to connect with others and hire outstanding individuals and motivate and make big change 
and traverse the challenges that are going to come, his magnitude's increased. And I just see very few founders doing that. And so I, I deeply encourage founders to find a great and intelligent coach, therapist, and spiritual teacher and enjoy that journey and work on yourself. The people who say confidently that they don't need the work are the people who need it the most. The people who criticize it, describe it as navel gazing, are the people most afraid of it. Um, so if there's a thing I can give to young founders and I give it a lot and I've never seen them regret it, it's to help them, you know, find great therapists, find great help to allow them to become the brilliant leaders they can. Even today, I had conversations with two unicorn CEOs, both of whom you know, and they both said, oof, I suffer from deep anxiety. One of them just started to get help, just saw a person. The other is yet to meet this person. And I guarantee that about every founder has and needs similar levels of help. They're just denying it, denying it and lying it to themselves. And please don't take this as me painting a picture of founders being mentally unstable. It's a quote unquote mental health issue. Humans are squishy and products of their environment and there's no perfect person. But the founders tend to be the ones that are the roughest around the edges and are so strongly motivated to do the crazy work that we do. And they're the ones that both need the most help and can benefit the most from it. When you can get out from under the crippling anxiety or the, the, the tightly wound ego that holds you back, your potential for impact is incredible. Yeah. I think the, I think the point on founders or anybody, I guess, that go into therapy is that maybe in my mind, it, at least in my experience, it's less about the fear of the therapy as much as it's the, like, the, the, the feeling that we talked about with your OCD. Insert your word there. Okay, let's put anxiety in there. Is this the thing that's going to make, not make me successful if it goes away? Is exactly. That exactly. I, like, like almost like, I, am, I gonna I, am I going to lose sure. that? Let, let, let me put it this way. Imagine if, this is the worst fucking analogy, but imagine you had just one leg and you got really, really good at you know, racing one-legged races. And someone said, I can give you a new leg. Would you say, oof, but I'm not going to be good at racing those races anymore. You're going to take the damn leg. If you could be way happier, find deep peace in yourself, be able to connect with and make time for the people you love, die a happy man, would you take it? You have to. That's the first thing. Second thing is, your rough edges and insecurities maybe got you and other founders into this game, for sure. We're a bag of things, and that tends to be like the biggest one in the bag. But all humans want to also be of service to other humans. They want to invest in their communities. They want to solve problems. They want to use their God-given gifts and talents. And when the ego goes away, those rough edges, the anxiety goes away, these more beautiful things emerge. And just like me now, that's less obsessed with making money for myself and success for myself, I'm now more excited to help others. Similarly so, will others find the same. Last point I'll make, however, is that we talk about therapy and working on ourselves and healing from trauma. The language we use, it imagines that there's a before and an after moment where these things are no longer problems. Actually, these quote unquote problems are just our characteristics, our personality. They're deeply carved neural networks from our youth when we were blank slates. They'll never actually go away. Um, Ram Das, who was a uh, very, very, very popular, very important spiritual teacher who died in recent years, said, and this is a, a, a misquote, um, 
uh, or at least a paraphrase. So when I asked him at the end of his life, like, you know, did you, you know, ever get over your bullshit? Uh, and he's like, well, and this is a guy who's done, you know, 70 to 80 years of the deepest spiritual work. He's like, well, you know, over the years, the edges certainly got smoothed away, but I still have them. And so what really happens is, and I'm only like 11 years into my own spiritual and therapeutic work, what really happens is, is that the sharp edges that previously created a phenomenal amount of pain and drove you, where the driver in the bus, they smooth away and you have awareness of them. They still motivate you. I still want to prove myself and be successful. But they're not the driver of the bus all the time. Sometimes I'm like, fuck, why don't I get recognition for this thing? Or I want to be more successful than that guy. You know, my ego shows up. But then pretty quickly I'm like, well, that's my ego. And that's okay. Everyone has ego. It's really important that we have ego. We take care of ourselves. Um, but that's not all of me. I also have heart and compassion and care and love and purpose and a mission to help others and build cool shit. And I'm going to integrate it all. I'm not just going to be the ego guy. I'm also going to be the, the guy with these other things. So, you know, yes, I get it. You're afraid of losing your edge. I guarantee you will be so much happier. And the edge doesn't go away. It transforms and it becomes an integrated part of a much bigger, more beautiful whole that will help you feel far more realized than you ever could have if you were just the broken ego guy. It's an amazing place to leave it. I, I appreciate you coming here and doing this. Of course. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, are you hiring? I'm hiring. Welcome aboard. What are you hiring are you looking for? looking for a job? Um, all the stuff. If someone you wants know, to apply. All the things. I mean, engineers and designers, people in their people team, recruiters, um, many different types of marketers. Um, all the things. It's like a, it's like a very well-funded startup. You know, <laughs> yeah, we are a, th a thousand people um, with an annual budget in the hundreds of millions. We're profitable. We're founder-led. We have an insanely high bar for talent. We're able to hire the very best in the industry, like Archana. We're working in the biggest space of the biggest space amongst the biggest changes since the industrial revolution we're highly principled and values oriented we value hard work and brilliance we want to make the most of our lives and our careers we do away with all the social justice stuff and culture war stuff if that's important to you in your personal life that's awesome we don't do it at work people love that um, we're constantly changing the rules we move fast we're leading an entire industry Great people want to be part of that magic. And our unique value proposition is that we have that big budget and we have the magic of a startup too. So I'm not imagining that there aren't also brilliant companies out there who offer similar things, but we're pretty unique. Companies of our stage usually have a lot more stability. They're baked. There's not as much opportunity for um, impact and they don't get to be part of this kind of like founder juju and I think you do it Intercom I think ask Glassdoor when you uh, <laughs> when you uh, when you hear the word grit what do you think of resilience um, I think of an ability to take pain often pain we cause for ourselves to roll with the rough and tumble to pick ourselves up when we fall off the horse because we'll fall off many times a day. I don't think of someone who's disconnected from their emotions. I don't think of the stereotypical hardcore, I've got no feelings, prototypical macho bro. I think of someone who is just able to recover and keep getting up and take the punches, acknowledge the pain, Oof, that hurt. Or 
I'm hating on myself today because of the, these bad standards or insecurities that I have. Accept all that. Don't deny it. And then get back up because you don't have to get back up, but it's what the greats do. It's what you want to do. It's how you'll continue to contribute to your mission. And you've got just one life, as far as I know, and one career. And you only get to do the thing you're doing a small number of times. We are all so incredibly blessed that we get other people's money to build these crazy fun things. Get back up and get in the mix. Have a little bit of grit. You, uh, you are a lot of people in this next generation of software really look up to you. Mm. And um, I think you're a worthy, imperfect role model. Thank you. And um, I think your willingness to share all of that messiness mm. is, um, frankly, it's why I do this show. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. So it's I appreciate very sweet it. of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, man. My pleasure.